we want to look at uh, ties that binds. We have been having a seminar on uh, uh, courtship and marriage. And uh, at this moment, I want us to look at uh, ties that binds. That is the topic that we have. And so I'd like us to pray. And then without wasting a lot of time, go into the word of God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before your presence. You have said that uh, the Sabbath has a double blessing, Lord. Let us not uh, come out of it, but people who have missed what you want to speak to us. And we pray that uh, the lessons we learn, we may make them practical in our lives, that your name may be glorified, Lord. Let us not do anything out of selfish ambitions. And Lord, help us to esteem others more than we esteem ourselves. May the holy angels, the holy watchers be amongst us to make sure that the network is right, but also to impart us the bread from heaven. And Lord, speak to me as I speak to your people. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Ties that binds. When uh, we talk about uh, ties that binds, we are really looking into what we are getting into. And uh, as a young people, we have to be more serious with uh, the life choices we make today. We have to be more serious with the choices we make today because they'll determine their entire scope of our lives till Jesus Christ comes. And uh, from uh, experience, as just we open the book of Genesis chapter two. Genesis chapter two. Ties that binds. Are you going to be tied to something that will bind you from doing the will of God or are you going to be tied with something that will bind you to serving your Lord? These are the core issues that we have to look into when we are talking about courtship and marriage. And uh, there's a tendency of uh, when you speak to the young people, they don't want to listen. And uh, I'm an old man, praise the Lord. Yes. I'm 37 years old. So I think only some two people here or three are beyond my years. Don't look at my face. Just listen to what I'm speaking. I'm old. So whatever I'm going to share with you, it's not something that I have read in the Bible. It is something that is, I have experienced it in my own life all through these years that I have been living on this earth. And if I tell you like that, I'm telling you something that will happen in your life if you don't take the instructions. Because we are not just sharing theoretical information because theoretical information have been shared with a lot of people. You can find them on YouTube, on internet, on Google. You can go Google these theories, but we are sharing some experiences that we, are, we have passed through life and what we are facing in our marriages. Uh, I'm in marriage two years now. You may think that is, uh, a small period being in marriage. Yes, there have been people who have been in marriage for 20, 50, 60 years. But uh, ask them how their marriages are. It's not a simple thing that uh, they are facing. And so young people, we better take heed in what you are saying, amen? Yeah, because this is not for my benefit. It is for your benefit because uh, as I say, there have been a tendency when you speak to the young people, they say, okay, you passed through this, let us pass through it and have this experience. No, you are deceived. You don't have to pass through the experience that others have passed through, which are not good in the sight of the Lord. And that is the reason why we are laying foundation so that you may know what to do when um, you 
uh, get into those ties that uh, we are in. Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 onward to 25. And uh, I'll try to share it quickly. Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. It is verses, verses 21. That is where I'll start. It says, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, I do not want to add a lot of flavor in what uh, the Bible says, but there are some stories behind the story. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. These are experiences that happens when people are in vision, is it? Have you ever read that? That sometimes people are in deep sleep and they have visions or we are not sure of that. And then the Lord took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. What if we say that what God had shown to Adam is exactly what he brought unto him in the vision or in the deep sleep? And so we are not just talking about men and women doing things haphazardly, but actually the Lord impressing on them some things. Therefore shall a man do what? Leave his wife and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked. The man and his wife were not ashamed of it. There is a lot of story there. And so uh, it is the Lord himself, and we have repeated this over and over, that uh, gave the man the wife, that, uh, that is Adam. And immediately Adam saw Eve, what did he say? This is what? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. How many are in marriages that can say, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh? We want to deal with real issues. We don't want to just read theoretical things here. Can you look into your marriage and say, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh? And we shouldn't be liars in the house of God. And those who are in courtship, can you look into your courtship and say, this is bone of my bone, this is flesh of my flesh? This is where the rubber really hits the road. And if that is the case, if that's not the case, then you have to rethink about the whole issue of your courtship and your marriage. It means that there is a place that things didn't go right. Amen? Yeah. And why did things not go right? Because the foundations that were laid were not according to the word of God. And this is the issue that is really making people have divorce, have incompatibilities, and uh, this is the issue that has brought a lot of uh, a spiritual declination in our churches. We wonder why our churches are not growing spiritually. Do you know why? Because the foundation of a spiritual church which should be laid in the family, it is missing. And so you cannot practice church in church if you can't practice church in the family. 
if you have gotten everything wrong from relationship to courtship and then to marriage, don't think that you can make a better church. Because the church is in need of a people who have built everything upon the principles of God. And so when marriages and courtship, uh, when courtship and relationship are not conducted in the way of the Lord and the things are carried into the family, the problem of the family is extended unto the church of God. And that's why the church is still in its infancy. We, are, we want to have a generation which actually can show forth that the Lord has really restored these things. And uh, uh, these things doesn't have to come to happen in the marriage. The foundation of marriage has to be laid in relationship and courtship. And when it fails to be laid in relationship and courtship, then you cannot make it in marriage. Why, where does the Bible uh, talk about that, every foundation being laid in the relationship and in the courtship before marriage takes place? Remember Zechariah chapter six, verse 13. What does it say? And he shall build his temple and the council of peace shall be between both of them, is it? The council of peace between who and who? The Father and the Son, Jesus Christ and the Father, what were they counseling about? Jesus has an idea that he's going to get married. Do you understand that? Is it true or is it false? Has Jesus Christ been married? Not yet. Christ is not married yet. He is in courtship. Is it true? But he has to have a counsel with his father if this thing will work out and if his father allows it to happen. And so the foundation is laid and Christ has to make sure that in this courtship, in this relationship, everything is right before he actually gets into a marriage. And so the family in heaven, when the new Jerusalem, uh, during the second coming of Jesus Christ, is really something that is approved of by everyone. The angels, Moses who is in heaven and Elijah. And everyone that is in heaven and the inhabitants of the other worlds have approved of this courtship and now they can marry Christ with his church in Revelation chapter 19. I'm asking ourselves, are our courtship accepted by angels, the inhabitants of unfallen worlds, and everyone that is involved in this thing? What kind of foundation are we trying to build as a people? And so if this foundation is not made up, don't think that it can work out in marriage. I tell you, it's not easy to work out in marriage. And that is why Christ doesn't risk to take just anyone in heaven. He takes everyone in heaven who has been approved that he is ready for that marriage. And so the reason why marriages are struggling today, it is because they went ahead to enter into things that cannot be approved by anyone on this world in the unfallen world and in heaven. And so marriages are trying to be patched up, but the real problem was in relationship and in courtship. And so let us look at the prejudices that actually happens in uh, courtship and then they are carried in in marriage. Looking at the ties that uh, binds and know that all these things will come to interfere with your happiness and all that, that stuff. And we looked at this and repetition makes impression for those who are not here so that uh, we may be able to get to the root cause of the matter. A young man who enjoys the society and wins the friendship of a young lady unbeknown to her parents does not act a noble Christian part toward her or toward her parents. Through secret communications and meeting, he may gain an influence over her mind but in so doing, he fails to manifest that nobility and integrity of soul, which every child of God will possess. In order to accomplish their ends, they act a part that is not frank and open and according to the Bible standard and prove themselves untrue to those who love them and try to be faithful guardians over them. And this is what happens in many schools and in the many universities that people are in. This is uh, Letters to Young Lovers, page 49. And so you find that uh, People will be headstrong to do things. And then at the end of the day, 
they find themselves in problem and the marriages don't work out. And it is not just an issue of uh, taking somebody to your parent that you want to have a courtship and then marriage to this person. It is just going beyond introduction to these people. It is uh, making sure that uh, you are going for a commitment into this relationship to have a higher spiritual experience with the person. And I said that uh, when you make the steps of taking a lady uh, as a person who will be under your roof, you are becoming the parent of that person. And it means that you are taking the role of a stewardship over this person. It's like you have just taken the child from the parent. How do you take care of the child whom you have taken from the parent? Brought that child into a strange land where they do not know anything. They are under your protection and they, you are in charge of their spiritual growth in everything. And so it is not just about brothers and sisters introducing somebody to your parent. And uh, this is where uh, our, our young ladies become so vulnerable. And young people in primary schools, I want you to listen very much, very well, because there's something happening in those schools which is not right. And uh, this familiarity that we have in, in our schools and in our colleges, it is something that should be shunned like leprosy because it doesn't help out. And uh, young sisters, we are talking about yesterday that uh, suppose that you had something, you own something and somebody took it without asking you for permission. What is that? Stealing. It is stealing. Do you understand me? Mm -hmm. If you had something and somebody took it without asking you, it is doing what? Mm -hmm. It is stealing. What if a man starts approaching you without approaching the parents who gave birth to you? It is the same principle it is stealing. And it's not just stealing in affections, it, it comes bottom line to stealing in spirituality and all these things. Because you have just taken somebody from their parents who should be instructing them in their spiritual. And uh, many of the things that uh, happen in, in the marriage have been uh, a laid foundation in, uh, in the courtship. In your courtship and in your relationship, how much time do you spend to share the word of God and uh, 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 talk about the eternal things rather than just how you will set up your family on this earth? What if God came before you married? Have you prepared this person to be in heaven? You see, sometimes people enter into courtship and they think the, the, the only thing they have the duty of doing is to prepare these people for a marriage here on earth. That is one of the things that is actually laying the foundation that will not help in the family. When you enter into courtship, you are entering into that stage where you are preparing somebody to sit in the heavenly table on that day of the marriage of the lamb. And so instead of spending more time in preparing how you should live together in your own family, you should be preparing this person how to live in heaven. And if you take your time in nurturing this person to live in heaven, then just when they come, when you come together, you are, when you, you, you are united together in marriage, you see, it's like heaven is practiced here on earth because you have prepared this person to live in heaven above. When you come in the house and start living together, you start living that heaven on earth before Jesus Christ comes. And this is what is missing in our families. Our families are hell on earth because our courtships and relationships were hell on this earth. And so to trifle with hearts is a crime of no small magnitude in the sight of Holy God. And yet some will show preference for young ladies, young men and call out their affection and then go their way and forget all about the word they have spoken and their effect. A new face attracts them and they repeat the same words devote to another the same attention. And this is what we found in Ephesians chapter one. A woman has to submit everything to the husband, but because 
they have been in many relationships and they have been submitting to this relationship. They don't have anything to offer in marriage because they have submitted everything in their relationship, different relationships that they have been. It was not the will of God that people hope from this relationship to another relationship. Just the way God presented the first and the last woman to Adam. This is how God wanted to be, that you meet a lady for the first time, that is your first and your last. But because of sin, some things have happened which have uh, the Lord had not made it to happen. We shouldn't be jumping from one relationship to another. These are the mistakes we made. These are mistakes I made. And sometimes they affect my marriage because uh, what I have to give in my marriage, I had already given out in this relationship. We don't want such a things being repeated in the people who are not yet married. But if you are married, I'll be talking how you can be able to uh, uh, forget your past and live in the present and still give your all that you had to give, although your life has been ruined. I'll be dealing with the, how do you live with the unconverted husband or how do you live in a difficult marriage? But the foundation has to be laid in the relationship. And it's good to have a good relationship right now so that when you get to the marriage, these things do not affect you. And so we are told, can we then be particular to circumspect? Admit, uh, this is uh, pamphlet 167.8.4. Safety lies in close adherence to rules and regulations in harmony with God's great moral standard of righteousness. And then there are those who, if so disposed, will find ways to secretly carry out their own inclinations and pursue a course of deception to avoid the censure of those they deem, so what? Particular, if somebody you think that will be so particular with you is in your life, you try to avoid them so that actually they may not have their way in what you are dealing with. And so by running away for, from these people will be particular with you. You really miss a blessing in your life. And all you attract in your life is problems in the future. In fact, I like people who will approach me and tell me my sin directly without missing about words. That person will save me. And if you are such a person, then you are my friend. I do not like a, a people who go about around the bush and try to uh, not bring things direct to me. I like that direct people who tell me, Sam, what you are doing is sin. And if you don't change this, you are bound to go to hell. I I'll appreciate that with the good tone. But people who means around the words and clothes sin as if it were not sin. Such a people will never help you. And so E.G. White is warning about you secluding yourself from people who can be so particular with you and point out your problem. And this is how courtships and relationships are conducted. And the pastors and the elders have failed their work because they will want to please the people. They don't want to hurt feelings. It's better to hurt people's feelings in courtship and relationship than let them enter into marriage and the marriages are not working. And so, we are told some who have influence, who are apparently working for the interest of the sanitarium encouraged by their own course of action, a disregard of rules and order. The influence of such a person goes a long way toward encouraging insubordination, especially in the direction of courtship and marriage. They follow impulse and blind passion. The courtship is carried on the spirit of what? Flirtation. The, the, the parties frequently violate the rules of modesty and reserve and are guilty are uh, guilty of indiscretion if they do not break the law of God. The high, noble, lofty design of God in the institution of marriage is not discerned. Therefore, the purest affection in the heart, the noblest traits of character are not developed. Not one word should be spoken, not one action performed that you will not be willing the holy angels should look upon and register in the books above. You should have an eye single to the glory of God. The heart should have only pure, sanctified affection worthy of the following of Jesus Christ, exalted in its nature and more heavenly than earthly. And then it says, anything different from this is debasing, degrading in courtship and marriage cannot be holy and honorable in the sight of pure and holy God, unless it is after the exalted scriptural principle. Have we ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Do you know that every courtship and relationship should be carried on the basis of 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Sometimes we think that uh, uh, courtship and relationship is just about the love we call eros. 
But when you build your relationship and courtship on a rose, it cannot work as based on scriptural principle. First of all, there must be this agape love, the undying love that will consider what God is talking about. After you have agape love in your heart and you know that you are standing right with God, then you can lead your partner to a right standing with God. But if any courtship and relationship is not conducted on the basis of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, then you know that you are in a wrong relationship. You know that your marriage is going to be turbulent. And the sooner you start reconsidering it, the better. Prejudices, ties that binds. Because you are going to be bound in something for your lifetime. The prophet still speaks. unless it is after the exalted scriptural principle. What is this scriptural principle? Marriage that heaven can bless. Instituted by God, marriage is a sacred ordinance and should never be ended upon in a spirit of selfishness. Those who contemplate this step should solemnly and prayerfully consider its importance and seek divine counsel that they may know whether they are pursuing a course in harmony with the will of God. The instruction given in God's word on this point should be carefully considered. Heaven looks with pleasure upon a marriage formed an honest desire to conform to the directions given in the scripture. And so if men are in habit of praying twice, they should pray how many times? Are we together? If men and women are in habit of praying twice a day before they contemplate marriage, they should pray how many times? How is marriage and prayer related actually? Prayer is the key that unlocks the treasures of heaven and moves the hand of the omnipotence. So it means that as you enter into your relationship and courtship, you are entering into a higher experience and closeness with God, amen? Because a person who spends their time on their knees seeking the face of the Lord, we are told in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, that uh, as we draw closer to him, we are changed from glory to glory. And so relationships and marriages and courtships should be taking us closer to God than drawing us closer to God. If you are in a relationship, that your former experience with God has gone down, know that you are in a wrong relationship. We don't have to mean words on that one. Have your relationship, have your courtship increased your experience with God? If this is not the case, then you, are, you know you are in a wrong relationship. And we are not just talking about those people who want to get married. We are talking about even the friends that uh, we put ourselves with, we, we connect ourselves in. You may be here and you are not uh, in a relationship or in a courtship, but uh, you have friends you, whom you have put besides you. Have they elevated you to go closer or to come closer to Christ or they have drawn you away from Christ? And so how many of us seated here will say that since I ended into this relationship and marriage, I have grown closer to God? Since I became a friend of this and this person, I have grown closer to God. I read more the Bible, I pray more, I do more evangelistic campaigns, and I get source to Christ. Is there anyone in that, with that experience in this room? These are the things that are really affecting us. <clears throat> since you got into that relationship, since you got to that marriage, since you got that friend you decided to have, have your spiritual journey doubled because it was twice. You were twice spiritual, but now you are fourfold spiritual. I'm telling you, if you start overlooking these things, then forget about having a better marriage. 
you are preparing for failure in your marriage. The majority of marriages, uh, the majority of marriages of our time and the way in which are conducted make them one of the signs of the last days. Men and women are so persistent, so headstrong that God is left out of the question. Religion is they done what? Laid? Can we see the screen? Religion is done what? And if it had no part to act in this solemn and important matter, but unless those who profess to believe the truth are sanctified through it and exalted in thought and character, they are not in favorable position before God as the sinner who has never been enlightened in regard to its claims. Any relationship, any courtship conducted not on the foundations that are in the scripture, you are compared to a sinner who has never known anything about Christ. It doesn't know, matter how much you know the verses. We are rapidly approaching the close of the world history. Every moment is of the most solemn importance to the child of God. The question that should come to every uh, heart up, am I uh, what? A Christian is the word of God my study, Christ dwelling in my heart by faith is the law of God, the rule of my life. And so this is not a subject to be treated lightly. And then we looked at uh, above everything else, they will point them to their never failing friend and counselor if uh, godly parents are consulted. And if you don't have godly parents, you are coming you are a Seventh Day Adventist and you are coming from a, a, a family that are not Seventh Day Adventist. What shall you do? We are told that our spiritual parents are there. But don't forget this. Everyone in this world is a steward of your life. But you have your first parent, which is the Father, which are in heaven. And you have your brother, which is Jesus Christ, the advocate, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And these two, by their Holy Spirit and the angels, can guide you in the way that your parents and your friends will never guide you. And so the first consultation in relationship and courtship should not be your friends, but should be God. Everything, those who are in marriage, instead of asking people how you will deal with your marriage, have you asked God how you can deal with your marriage? Because many people will give you an experience which will not help you in your marriage. So what is God telling you on how to deal with your relationship, courtship and marriage? And so it is only in Christ that a marriage alliance can be safely performed. Human love should draw its closest bonds from divine love. Now you found that the Eros love, this platonic love and all this love, where are they drawing their strong bond? Where are they drawing their strong bonds? Maybe you missed it. We have different loves, is it? Yeah. If you may say. We have that eros, paternal, and all this love that you can call them their names. But before you have that love, there is some love that should be in your heart, the divine love. And so all other love draws love from the divine love, which is agape love. And so that is why I said that every courtship, every relationship should be formed on the basis of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And if I have time, I'll talk about what is love by the way. Some people, the way they define love it is something that is really wonderful. <laughs> Christianity ought to have a condoling influence upon the marriage relation. But it is too often the case that the motives which lead to this union are not in keeping with Christian principles. Satan is constantly seeking to strengthen his power over the people of God by inducing them to enter into alliance with his subjects. And in order to accomplish this, he endeavors to arouse and sanctify passion in the heart. But the Lord has in his word plainly instructed his people not to unite themselves with those have, who have not his love abiding in them. And so, young ladies, not all Seventh-day Adventist men have love of God in their hearts. 
and all the men who are here, not all Seventh day Adventist ladies actually have the love of God in their heart. And so we should be careful where whichever thing that we are doing. And uh, how do we understand, how do we come to know that uh, the people whom we are in courtship and relationship with uh, do not have the love of God in their hearts? It is when they have an affection for the things of the world more than they have the affection of the things of God. I'm thankful about my wife because there are some things she didn't ever ask me when we were entering into courtship. And I'm glad when I went to her mom, she never asked me such a things. Like, what kind of job am I doing? How much do I earn? What kind of a house do I have? And how do I plan to have the things I'm missing in life? Material things. There are relationships which are actually based on materialistic things, what people will gain when they enter into this marriage, than thinking about just the materialistic world. Yes, the inspiration tells us that uh, we should be able to provide our families, and those who cannot provide for their families, they should not be entering into marriage. They should think again. But those things <clears throat> should not be the driving force. <clears throat> that it is the material things that really are driving our courtship. So we were looking at something, uh, I'm waiting for people to settle. And so we get down to the, the most important things that uh, God is calling us to aim higher and not to tie ourselves in the things that uh, won't help us to reach his ideal in this life. And so Ties that binds. Are you tied somewhere <clears throat> where actually you are not benefited? Are you tied somewhere where you are not benefited? We are told. That, uh, we are told that time is so precious to be trifled with. Time is so precious to be trifled in, and uh, men and women have to consider how they use their time. Time is too precious to be lost in controversy that will arise over this matter. Let no question of this kind be permitted, which actually draws us away from the Lord. And uh, look at this, Solomon Appeal, page 104, paragraph one. Solomon Appeal, page 104, paragraph one. The marriage institution was designed of heaven to be a blessing to man, but in general sense, it has been abused in such a manner as to make it a dreadful curse. Most of men and women have acted in entering the marriage relation as though the only question for them to settle was what? Whether they did what? I have really lost my congregation. Let the children have their class. I want those who are remaining to concentrate. 
we, we are really speaking about eternal issues and don't be distracted by what is happening. Let us read again. The marriage institution was design of heaven to be a blessing to man. But in general uh, sense, it has been abused in such a manner as to make it a dreadful curse. Most of men and women have acted in entering the marriage relation as though the only question for them to settle was whether they love each other. Is that the basis of having a relationship or courtship? If you love each other. We really request people entering online to mute themselves, please. And so loving each other, and by the, the, the kind of love that we have for each other, what kind of love is that? Yes. I would say that um, the kind of love that is there among, you know, among us young people in relationships is, is more of feelings. We, we learned yesterday that, that true love, love that comes from Christ is a principle not a feeling. So the love that we have right now, uh, as somebody will put it, <laughs> uh, it's a love made in China. And in short, it's a, it's a, just a fleeting feeling. That's what, that's our understanding of love right now. But if you have agape love in your heart, you'll go all through the way. Where Sister White says that you should never consider your marriage a mistake. Yeah? Immediately you consider it a mistake, it cannot work even though you are in abusive marriage. But all these things can be made up in relationship and coaching. Now, look at education page 216 paragraph three. We are talking about the prejudices and ties that binds. You are entering into something that will bind you forever. Be careful the unions that you are making because after you exchange vows, brothers and sisters, I tell you, Unless you are not a Seventh-day Adventist, you will chase that lady. Or that lady will leave you. Since both men and women have a part in homemaking, boys as well as girls should gain a knowledge of household what? Duties. To make a bed and to put a room in order to wash dishes, to prepare a meal, to wash and repair his own clothing. Is a training that need not make any boy less manly. It will make him happier and more useful. And if girls in turn could learn to harness and drive as a horse, to use the saw and armor, as well as the rake and the hoe, they will be better fitted to meet the emergencies in life. The lady that you are having in life and the man that you are having in life, is he ready to meet the emergencies that may come up in life? And this is a challenge to our people who are in the university. And I, I cannot hide you this. Soon and very soon, there will be no employment. True or false? Are you ready to live without a job? Or are we having a theoretical knowledge of what is life? And then soon and very soon, we have entered into relationship, courtship, and then marriage. And then we can't even manage our families because such a small duties, we have not learned to do them. There's a lot of prejudices going on about relationship, courtship, and marriage. People don't see them as real things and real-time events that will affect you. Start thinking about the man that you are having. Is it, is it because he has a job? The lady that you are having, is it because he has a job? And if these are the things that uh, really moved you to go into that relationship, then start considering it because very soon, in one year, in two years' time, we won't be having jobs, people employed. You saw how many people have lost their jobs. In a short while, all companies are integrating computers in their offices so that a work that could be done by 100 people is being done by one man. And so what if you did these courses and you don't have a job? Where will you start your life? Have you learned how to meet emergencies in life? or you're waiting to learn them when you reach in marriage. What is it that you are doing with your life? Uh, I used to ask the people who are in boarding school, the youths, 
that I, I, I meet on Sabbath. You people, you get a lot of uh, pocket money. What does it do? I come to you, the people who are in the universities and these people who are in, uh, uh, not in universities. We have been away from school for one year. Is it true or false? What shows that you have been at home? What are the results of being at home for one year? We don't have a result. What of me that I have been at home? What can I show to show that I have been at home? What have I done with my life? With the little knowledge maybe you gained in college or wherever place, what have you done at your home this whole year? And so these are the things that you should be thinking about because they will even affect your marriage. Another cause of deficiency of the present generation in physical strength and moral worth is the union of men and women in marriage whose age do what? Or you just find a man, he tells you, I love you, and then it's okay. You don't consider his age. Now, the people who are fluctuated and who are infatuated, I mean, do not consider these things, even age is something that you should think about. The disparity in age that widely differ will affect you very much. It is frequently the case that all men choose to marry young wives. By thus doing, the life of the husband has often been prolonged while the wife has had to feel the want of that vitality which she has imparted to her aged husband. And it is vice versa. You find a young man marrying an old lady or somebody who is so much his age. It goes vice versa. And at the end of the day, the marriage life will not be good. You'll spend most of the time in hospital. You'll spend most of the time you are sick. And so you don't want to come into this marriage where actually instead of doing the will of God and being busy with doing what God wants you to do, you are busy having a, a patient in your house in the form of a wife or a husband because you married with disparity of age. It has not been the duty of any woman to sacrifice life and health even if she did love one so much older than herself and felt willing on her part to make such a sacrifice, she should have restrained her affections. She had consideration higher than our interest to consult. I have some 20 minutes, I'll be done. It's still worse for young men to marry women considerably older than, in fact, I say, and I can be justified that, uh, a man should not marry a woman older than him. Because you are talking about God made man in his own word. And Christ is under God. God is the greater. And then Christ is the younger. And if we should translate that to marriage, which is a symbol of the father and the son, you will find that sometimes it's a problem. When, who was created first? Adam, Adam then Eve. Eve. And so who should be older? Adam. Adam. Adam should be old. I hope I won't go to an extreme. And if I go to an extreme, you just raise your hand and say, I have something against that. We want to deal with these issues that are affecting us. Don't go and say that guy was an extremist and a fanatic. Just raise your hand here and tell me you are a fanatic. And so these things should be considered. You find that everyone in the Bible, Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, uh, Isaac and Rebecca, and all these people. There's a reason why God makes things to be like that. And then you find Adam was taller than Eve a little bit, is it? Yeah. Am I saying that uh, you should marry somebody who is taller than you? I I'm looking at the age bracket and how God thinks me. There is an order that God wants us to have, but these minute things are not looked upon and then they affect us. And so it's not about uh, being taller or short, but uh, consider the age. We are looking at the quote, consider the age of these things. It is still worse for young men to marry women considerably older than themselves. The offspring of such a unions in many cases where 
ages widely differ have not well balanced minds. They have been deficient also in physical what? Strength. In such a family, varied, peculiar, and often painful traits of character have frequently been manifested. The children often die prematurely, and those who reach maturity in many cases are deficient in physical and mental strength and moral worth. You are considering to enter into marriage. Have you discussed how many children you are going to have? Ladies, are you present? These things you cannot talk right now. You will talk when you reach outside, is it? Let us discuss for a moment. Have you discussed with your man how many children you are going to have? Or now you find yourself in marriage and this year you are giving birth. The next year your husband needs a child. The next year, and you go on looking for even a male child because you have been getting only female children. I'm telling you, if you don't lay your foundation in courtship, you don't have a marriage anymore. And that is why you hear that men have gone outside to look either for a male child or a female child, because you are only giving birth to male or female children. Have you discussed these things before you go to marriage? Or you are waiting until you reach marriage, and then in that day, you are telling your husband, you know, I just want one child. And the husband is telling you, I need five. What do you do? You go back to the pastor and tell him this marriage is not going to work. So what? You take back your vows? Let, let us be, let us have our eyes open. And don't just accept anything in the life. Discuss things before you get married. And so uh, those who increase their number of children when if they consulted reason, they must know the physical and mental weakness must be their inheritance are transgressors of what? The last six precepts of God's law. What does the second commandment say? Thou shall love thy neighbor as you do what? You love yourself. And if you haven't agreed with your spouse, what you should be doing in marriage, do you know what? You don't love your wife. You may say a hundred times, I love you, but that is nothing. And those are some words that I dread talking about. Most of men and women have acted in entering marriage relationship as though the only question for them to settle was whether they love each other, but they should realize the responsibility rests upon them in a marriage relation further than this. I have long been designing to speak to what? To my sisters. They are not always careful to abstain from all appearances of evil. They are not all circumspect in their deportment as becometh women professing godliness. Their words are not as select and well chosen as they should be for women who have received the grace of God. They are too familiar with their brethren. They lean around them, incline toward them, and seem to choose their society as and are highly gratified with their attention. If you have such a lady or a man, come out of her, my people. A lady who is always, and a man who is always uh, 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 wanting to enjoy the, uh, the, the society of the opposite sex. This is not somebody that you should be getting in marriage with. He will spend his time flirting with other people's house husbands and other people's wives. There should be a restraint. And if you are in a relationship where actually your man always spends time with other ladies and your lady spends time with other uh, uh, men, you have trouble. And we have what we call uh, social satisfaction, or uh, this is uh, 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 emotional satisfaction. You see, many people are in relationships, but their emotional satisfaction is not coming from their relationship, but it's coming from other sources. You find that even people are married and being, uh, instead of being satisfied emotionally and social, socially from their spouses, they get that. Have you ever seen people who are so happy in the presence of other people and not happy in the presence of their wives and their partners? And you are still going to get married to that guy. 
you think that happiness will come when you are in marriage. You are still going to get married to that woman. You, you think that he will change when you get into marriage. No. If this is how he behaves and this is how she behaves, then better break that engagement today. Now we are calling for a higher standard and it seems such a, a great thing to make, but I tell you it is for our benefits, those who are not married. And so the sisters should encourage true meekness. They should not be forward, talkative and bold, but modest and slow to speak. There is too much careless, loose cause freedom of manner by some women professing goldness, which leads to greater wrongs. And I have always said that uh, uh, God blessed me because I don't have a talkative wife. That is not bragging. I don't like women who talk a lot. And the spirit of prophecy doesn't encourage that. If you have a lady who talks too much, try to train her right away. Not Women in marriage, don't talk a lot. Even if your husband is talking, try to listen. Try to pretend you are not, you, you are dumb. At the end of the day, it will help out. But he talks, you talks, he talks, you talk. It will never, it will never solve the problems in marriage. It can never solve the problems in courtship. If you are talking and the lady is talking, and even she speaks more words than you are speaking. No, you are in problems. You are bound to be in problems forever. And so, now this is something that people don't talk about so much, but think about it. And we are looking at the prejudices in relationship, courtships, and marriage. If the wife feels that she must, in order to please her husband, come down to his standard, when animal passion is the principal basis of his love, controlling his action, she displeases God, for she fails to exert a sanctifying influence upon her husband. If she feels that she must submit to the animal passions of her husband without a word of remonstrance, she does not understand her duty to him, nor to her God. Sexual excess will effectually destroy a love for devotional exercises. Now, when should this be discussed about sexual excess? No woman should aid her husband in this work of self-destruction. She will not do it if she enlightened. She is enlightened and truly loves her husband. Now, I leave for you to think about that, about sexual excesses. And by the way, sex is an affair of the mind. Don't think that it is the physical act itself. We think that sex is when people go to bed and have an intercourse. No, sexual excesses go beyond physicality. What are you discussing every time that you are on phone with your partner, whom you are relating with? How you look good? how you look impressive, how you want to look at you every now and then. You see, this kind of, uh, pray for me to get the right words because I may end up speaking something which will not be okay. Yes. What are you discussing with your partner every time when you spend on phone? What are you chatting? from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. And it shouldn't be even reaching 10 p.m. Because it doesn't give you enough time to have your devotion with God. At such a secrets of the night, it is when people approach God and ask them of what they need. This issue of husbands and wife and partners and the people who are in relationship chatting until 10, it's not something. I'm glad we have agreed with my wife. Beyond nine, there's no chatting. Sleep so that you may wake up early and seek the Lord. It may seem strange to you. It may stream something so uh, 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 gross in your marriage, but practice it and you'll find that you are growing spiritually. These are sexual excesses that shouldn't be there. At the end of the day, she's my wife. It doesn't matter if I chat with her the whole night, what will I have improved in her life? 
But we'll find even people who are not married, they go into those excesses of chatting and doing all that thing. And so you see, garbage in, garbage out, is it? Whatever is in the mind is what will reproduce. So if you are chatting for all those hours about these sexual things, do you think that this lady or this man can have words to pray to God? What is she thinking? 80% of her head has been preoccupied with what you are talking. What are you talking? For MR, as I finish, and I have 10 minutes, I'll be ended. As we, I, I, I want just to look at what is love for a minute, but before I do that, let me read this. <laughs> 4MR381. Will the man who loves his wife as Christ loved the church imperil her life and cut off from all missionary service? By filling her hands and mind with the grave responsibilities which children bring with them into the world, will he gratify his own passion to the sacrifice of his wife? subjecting her as often as possible to the painful ordeal of maternity. Is this cherishing the wife as Christ nourishes and cherishes the church? In pursuing such a course in the husband, is the husband studying the spiritual and physical good of his wife, that he may present her to God without sport and blameless. This is in line with sexual excesses. Filling the hands of your wife with children every now and then. Now, the problem is always not with the men also. The problem is with the women. Because we have been told that such advances should be remonstrated against. Now, we are not teaching people to uh, 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 withdraw from conjugal uh, uh, relationship with their husbands and their, their wives. But these excesses that happen in marriage do not bring about happiness but degeneration. And so there are many people who have not studied anatomy and physiology and understand how the body works, is it? Let us talk about zinc in the body of a man. What happens if he has excess sexual uh, 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 lifestyle? What happens to his zinc? It dies, is it? When you don't have zinc in your body, which problem will you face? Importance. And then you start looking for a child and then you don't get it. And the problem is zinc. And you keep trying every time and then, let us try in the morning, let us try in the evening. And you don't have zinc, take your time in prayer. Increase your zinc and then try out to get the child. But people don't even understand the simple anatomy and physiology of these things. What happens if actually there's sexual excesses? What happens to the body of a woman? I can see no one here in this room was ready to get married. Because we are told if you haven't studied anatomy and physiology, you shouldn't be even thinking to get married. It is seen. That is child guidance, page 65. You want me to project it so that you may believe. You should study anatomy and physiology so that you may know how to conduct your marriage. And again, if you happen to get a child with these sexual excesses, you know what happens to the child? The child brain is not formed in the right way. There's deformity. There's a lot of hormonal imbalances in these things. But men will go forward to please their physical needs and women to please their physical needs. They don't have a love of God who has given them the body to be the temple of God. Are you discussing these things in your relationship and courtship, young men and women? Or we are waiting to discuss them in marriage? Let 
Let us look at what is love as we bring this to an end. Prejudices, ties that binds. You are entering into something that is going to ruin you. Before you tie those knots, please be sure that you are doing the will of God. Be sure that this man is converted. Be sure that this woman is converted. You have no reason to get into a marriage where people are not converted. And if you are in such a marriage, I'm praying for you and you pray for me. Praise the Lord, I'm not in that marriage. I have a stable marriage. God forbid that Satan will come in and destabilize my marriage. But if you are in a marriage that is not working, it is a time that you sought God afresh. No divorce, no separation. We shall be dealing with that. Even if it's adultery, you have to approach it very carefully before you move to that separation and adultery. There's a letter that Sister White wrote to some brother and told him that uh, he can uh, separate with the wife because the wife was hindering him to do his duty because he was an elder in church. The wife could shout at him. It was not about adultery. The wife could shout at him. Uh, he, the wife could want his uh, uh, attention when they are in a meeting. And Sister White tell her, put away that girl. The wife sent her back to her mother so that she may learn some few things. And people have used that letter to do everything they want in marriage, that they can just put away their wives. Because Sister White advised this quarrelsome woman to be put away. Be sure that really you are doing what the, the will of God is. Have the Lord spoken to you that you should do that? And so separation and divorce is not just something to be trifled about. Let us look at uh, what is really love as we end. Which one? Oh, you need the quote. I refer you to the book Solomon Appeal. It is 150 pages. Make a habit of reading it daily in the evening. Yes, Solomon Appeal. Let us look at what is love and then we close. Maybe we didn't know what is love. We are talking about some strange things and uh, we don't know what is love actually. How does the Bible and the spirit of prophecy define what is love? Perhaps the most important motif of Ellen's white writing was the biblical expression that God is what? Love. God is love. And this is the basis of everything, relationship and courtship, because we found that the paternal love, platonic love, eros love draws its strength from the divine love, which is agape love. And so if we have a clear glimpse of what is love, the way it is being interpreted in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, then we can carry this principle to our courtship and our relationship. Because we are talking about ties that bind. You are entering into something that you will live with it forever. What is it that you are entering into? This sentiment uh, book ends a conflict of the ages uh, series as the fruit and last words of our uh, opus magnus, the greatest thing. This great and blessed truth that God is love was more than illustrative for she wrote emphatically that God is love. God is in himself, in his essence, love. And we understand that love is a pure love that will go all the way that can stand the storm of the time. Ellen White believed that God is love, God is life, and God is love and God is life in COL 258 and saying that love is power. Now, when we talk about love is power, what do we mean by love is power? Love is power of transformation. Transformation unto good. For good so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so the basis of your love to your partner is the love that transforms that they may have eternal life. And I have spoken about this several. That is the power of the love that you have for this person that even if they have negative dispositions in their lives, it may be able to transform them so that they may have Christ in their hearts. What kind of love do you have for your partner? 
Is it just to use her body, to use his body, and then degrade her spiritual life? It should be a love that actually will sacrifice everything to place her in the eternal kingdom. What kind of love are you having in your relationship and courtship? Is your basis of love producing, uh, producing a character that can be fit for heaven? It is the power which expels what? Sin from the soul. Are we in relationships and courtships and marriages where the love that we are giving is expelling sin from the heart? I tell you, we have never studied love the way it should be studied. And yet we stand before the people and say, I love you. The man who tells you, I love you, you should be wary of him. The woman who tells you, I love you, be wary of them. Ask them, what do you mean by you love? I don't. Do we ask these things? Or somebody sends you a text, I love you, and you are turning back, I love you. What are you loving? The text of the man, and what does he have to love? Or it is now automatic. You are an automatic switch. When you are told, I love you, you just return, I love you. This love is the spirit of what? Do you understand love is the spirit of God? Which pervades heaven where all love and unity. She continues to say, Ellen White wrote that love as its core is principle calling it the heavenly principle of eternal love and saying that love of a holy God is an amazing principle. That is divine love. And remember that all this other love draws their strength from this love, which is called eternal love or agape love. The love of God is something more than a mere negation. What do we, what we mean by when we say a mere negation? A mere negation is, is just the hating of something. That is not what the love of God is. Many people look at the love of God and they look at the commandments of God, which are a transcript of his character, and they see, thou shall not do this, thou shall not do that. But we have to look into the positivity of this love in giving his commandment. The love that you should be having is beyond seeing the negatives of the marriages that you are in, in the courtships that you are in. And that's the reason why people enter into courtship and they trifle about and they come out of it and they are saying that I'm in love. And so it is out of mere negation that their love is based on. It is not based on eternal love. How can I better this relationship or courtship or marriage? They are ready to jump on the negative side rather than on the positive side. And so it is a positive and active principle, a living spring ever flowing to bless others. Now, how much do you return when your partner gives to you? There's a story told of a child, a loving child, who knew that uh, the father was angry and the father gave out the food and the child gave back the father the food and told, I give you this, eat. Are you getting me? Are we together? In your relationship, you have been given so much. What have you given back? Do you know how people sacrifice to give what they give? Or you, are, you see you are entitled to what's given. I hear women saying that, you see you are the husband of the wife, you are entitled to do this and that. Do you think that is how God made things? That now just because you have been married and the man is the head of the house, he has to give everything that he has to give. You don't even understand the strengths that he's going through. You are in a courtship and a relationship as a lady and you are demanding everything. Or you are a man and you are demanding everything from your spouse. Can you give back what you have been given? True love is a higher principle, a pure holy principle, the one comprehensive principle. This love is not an impulse, but a divine principle, a permanent power a living principle, and it is the ruling principle. Divine love has a powerful purifying what? Influence. 
Pure and whole affection is not a feeling, but a principle. Pure love is not an impulse, a spasmodic feeling, but a principle that is divine, a permanent power. We imbibe it fresh from the current of love that flows from the heart. And that love of Christ is not a fitful feeling, but a, a living principle, which is to be made manifest as an abiding power. Lastly, Ellen White saw this as a principle that leads to action, saying love must be principle of action. Love is the underlying principle of God's government in heaven and earth. Love should be revealed in action. It is a principle manifest in works in noble and unselfish deeds, an active living working principle, a strong fixed principle revealed in word and an action. And so it is living principle, a principle that is manifest in action. True love, wherever it exists, will control the life. Thus, it is with the love of God. God is love. Writing more fully on the subject, she stated, when the heavenly principle of eternal love fills the heart, it will flow out to others, not merely because favors are received of them, but because love is the principle of action and modifies the character, governs the impulses, controls the passions, subdue enmity and elevates and ennobles the affections. This love is not contracted, contracted so as merely to include me and mine, but it's broad as the world and as high as heaven and is in harmony with the angel workers. And so brothers and sisters, we have entered into ties that binds in our relationship and courtships. How many of us can say that they are truly in love? Now think about this, God loved humanity, that when humanity sinned, God looked for them. Why do men enter into courtships and relationship and walk out? Because they have been looking for something to gain about, but they are not gaining. They are not interested in pursuing something better for this person. And at a small quarrel, at a small thing, they'll be able to put out their spouses. Those in marriages, marriages can't work because they are in those marriages to gain. What if your husband changes? What if your wife changes? What will you do with your marriage? And so before we tie the knots, before we stand before the preacher and say, yes, I do. Think about the things we have spoken about because you are going to be bound either for heaven or being bound for hell. May the good Lord be with us and uh, we shall pray and uh, have some questions. Shall we pray? Our heavenly father who dwells above in heaven, surrounded with cherubims, angels of light, we want to partake of the same, the light that surrounds you. And Father, I pray that you may remove every prejudice and every ties in our hearts that will not bring ennobling influence in our lives and unto Christianity. Help us to see the underlying points and themes and the end of everything that we are getting involved in. I pray that you may forgive us, those of us who missed in life, and uh, them that are struggling right now, Lord, may you give them power and even agape love in their hearts so that they may act on this basis of agape love and not impulses. Thank you for the guidance and thank you for thy presence. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.